Welcome to the Courage in Flight Show or Courage TV. Courage TV celebrates everyday people who have taken courageous steps in their lives. Our hope is to inspire you to live a powerful and courageous life. I'm your host, Dr. Tao Do, a communication coach for high performance entrepreneurs and professionals. You can learn more about me at taocoach.com. And today we have two very special guests, Mike and John Battaglia. Mike is a first honor student at the Queen of Apostles Catholic School in Alexandria. He's the youngest of four Battaglia children, and he's here with his dad, John Battaglia. Now, John is a trial and appellate lawyer who, for more than 22 years, has served clients in both private practices and in the United States Department of Justice. Today, they're going to perform a humorous speech on how to win the Toastmasters International Speech Contest, the real, the three real secret ingredients for winning it all. Let's welcome Mike and John Battaglia. Well, it's that time of year again. The time of year when you hear all about these magical speeches being given, all in pursuit of trying to win the Toastmasters International Speech Contest. It's also the time of year when you get to hear from all the pundits, the YouTube experts, the internet mavens, and all their unwanted advice about the tips you should follow to win the speech contest. Heck, we even have in our speaking group some huckster who offers a workshop where you can go after our meeting and practice to try and get better at public speaking. Like that ever worked. I say to all of those pundits, mavens, and workshop hustlers, what a bunch of garbage, because I have here for you now, special to Fairfax Public Access TV, the three real secret ingredients to winning the International Speech Contest. Dr. Dow, friends, all interested viewers, of which I know there are billions right now, let me start with a little bit about myself and my obvious background expertise on giving you these three secrets on how to win it all. For years, I competed in the International Speech Contest. No, I, I never won, but I took copious notes and for years on top of that, I was a prosecutor and I sat in a courtroom and listened to some of the most fantastic stories you could imagine. I think the law calls them alibis. None of those alibis, I don't think out of the hundreds of cases that I saw ever worked. Nobody got off or got a reduced sentence, but they were entertaining. So without further ado, Let's dive right in now to the three secret ingredients you must follow if you want to win the International Speech Contest. Secret ingredient number one, you must, at some point in your speech, ask a deep sounding rhetorical cliche. What does that mean? You have to ask a question at some point in your speech, and it really should be a cliche. Something like, did you try your best in life? Did you take a chance? Are you doing something courageous in life? Blah, blah, blah. Some sort of nonsense like that. But you just can't come out and say, oh, did you take a chance in life? Or, or did you take a courageous uh, step in life? No, 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 no. You have to ask the question in the context of the speech. And the key is, you have to make it sound deep. It doesn't actually have to be deep. It doesn't even have to actually make any sense for crying out loud. Here are some examples. Has your fish pedaled its 10 speed today? Or have you breathed through your elbows today? Or does this sound like a rhetorical question to you? That's it, folks. Good examples of how you can start off right off the bat with secret ingredient number one, asking that deep sounding rhetorical cachet. 
hit that one, you're already one third of the way there. So that means what, by my math, 60% of the way home to winning the whole thing. Secret ingredient number two, you have to be a witty klutz and fall on the stage. I mean it. This is not pro sports. It is not the Russian Bolshoi. There are no Fred Astaire speaking champions. Quite the opposite. The experts who write every year about the speaking champion invariably report how brave and daring it was for the champion to take a risk and fall on the stage. Parentheses, just like each of the previous 25 speaking champions. So you fall on stage too. Now, I'm nursing a bit of an injury, so I can't demonstrate for you myself the proper way to fall. But I brought with me a little expert, a fall guy, who's gonna show you what a winning fall looks like. Mike, take it away. There we go, that's how you hit the turf. Now remember, it's not just that you're a klutz in falling, you're a witty klutz. So after you hit the stage, you have to have that witty one-liner all ready to go. Something like, not again, or I hope no one saw that. Or something that Mike kept saying again and again last night when we were practicing her speech, and I kept insisting again and again that he practice his falls. Mike? Ouch! 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 These are all good, witty one-liners that will help you nail secret ingredient number two. And let's be clear, folks. Everyone, everyone should be capable of hammering secret ingredient number two. Because after all, the ground is hard to miss. Let's give a hand for Mike. That leads to secret ingredient number three. You can turn any one of life's regular moments, anything that we've all gone through, into a major melodrama. Now, to be clear, I'm not speaking here of people when they address real tragedies in their life, real hardships, but that's also my point. You don't need to have suffered such real hardships or tragedies in order to turn your speech into a championship speech. You can take the most mundane events that everybody has gone through in life and turn it into an international speech winner. The key is to make sure you add the requisite amount of melodrama to that mundane event and that you feign a little bit of indignancy, that you're a little bit upset about what happened to you in the past life as if you were wronged. For example, we've all had pets before. You might have your speech go like this. And so Mr. Snuffles, our family gerbil, died. He died in my arms that evening. Died a short 17 years after we first brought that furry little rodent into our home. Or it can be something about the early love of your life. And so Millicent, the fifth grade love of my life, said no, no, she would not go with me to the movies next Tuesday, and why? Because her parents didn't think it was right for 11-year-olds to go see a midnight showing of The Exorcist on a school night. Or even that dinner you went to last week where they messed up your order initially. And so the waiter brought me the wrong entree once more. He brought me not a 16 ounce New York strip with the cauliflower mash that I so desperately wanted. No, instead he brought me the pan seared tuna with the arugula and the pine nuts that I so desperately needed. There it is folks, add a little drama to any little one of life's events, throw in that rhetorical cliche and for the love of Pete, no. For the love of Mike, hit the turf. Do those three things and you are 99% going to win the international speech contest. Guaranteed. Dr. Tao.
If you are just tuning in, I'm here with Mike Battaglia. He is a hockey, basketball, and baseball player, and he's 10 years old. He's also a regular speaker at the Toastmasters Get Up to Speak Club, or Guts Club, in Annandale. He's here with his dad, John Battaglia, who is a lawyer and a member and past president of the Guts Club. Thanks for joining us, Mike and John. Thanks for having us. So, John, you and your wife, Kim, has four children, and you're constantly running around with their sports and their activities. Why do you do what you do? It's a function of really two things, I think. First, my parents did it for me, and my wife, Kim's parents, did it for her. And we feel like we owe it to our kids to provide the same sort of opportunities that we had growing up. But beyond that, I think there was actually a method to the madness, and it can be madness, but <laughs> I, think the, I think the method is that you learn in the world in a lot of different ways, not just through school or not just through one way or the other. And by being exposed to different events, different forms of competition, different kids, different walks of life, and it's very different between basketball and hockey and even baseball and going to guts on the weekend and speaking. Those are all vastly different events sometimes that you learn and grow in those sorts of ways, uh, or so we hope. And at least it turned out well for my wife. Well, <laughs> they're holding the verdict on me, but we, you can definitely see the growth among the kids. And over the years, we've previously had Mike as a speaker there, but also his siblings as well. And it's been a rewarding experience even though we surely uh, <laughs> should own half of Exxon between all the gas we put in the car and uh, spend a lot of time on the road or otherwise getting kids from point A to point B while also trying to juggle things like career and home and all the rest. So yeah. those are sort of the, the big picture reasons. Yeah, I can see it's, it's hard being a parent sometime with all the driving back and forth and you have that times four. So. And sometimes the drives are not short. So we spent a quality weekend in the Philadelphia, Delaware area last week going to a hockey tournament and just to uh, up the ante, mm -hmm. my wife was going to join us with our two other girls to come watch these guys in a hockey tournament. But that seemed too easy because after all, we were only driving a few hundred miles and going from place to place, hours away from each other sometimes for them to get to hockey games. That seemed too easy, so uh, my wife's car instead decided to up the ante and her car broke down outside Sorry. of Baltimore. So oh, no. you know, it's always a little roll with the punches <laughs> type of things that makes it interesting. So. Yeah, that's how you make memories. <laughs> there you go, we'll have that story forever. Right. <laughs> So Mike, you've done so many different activities. What is your favorite activity? By far my favorite activity is hockey. Hockey's a great opportunity for me. I really want to try out for AAA next year. I'm on the AA squirt team and it's going to be really fun. We just recently had a tournament in Delaware. We came in second place against our old foes, Ashburn. Mm -hmm but it was really great experience. Other tournaments, we went, one other tournament, we went to Canada, mm. and it was amazing there. I got the full Canadian experience. With the, <laughs> the full Canadian The experience. negative eight degree oh. weather. Yeah, blizzards. <laughs> it's gotta be super Losing cold. our bags. And losing the bags. Losing the bags, uh, and power going out, out in the hotel. Oh, so. no. But we'll remember that trip too. <laughs> yeah. That's another memory. <laughs> It's a really great opportunity since I started skating when I was two years old at my uncle's hockey rink. Yeah. And it was very, it was a great experience for me. I think I skated for around three hours that first time Aww. until I We had this on video. People oh. don't believe us. Yeah? We put him in skates when he was two <laughs> and put him on Uncle Tony's homemade hockey rink in Pennsylvania. And like a little baby kangaroo, he skated back and forth, <laughs> up and down. Literally, with no yeah. falling for three hours. And I finally had to pick him up like a suitcase <laughs> and walk off because yeah. he wouldn't get off the ice. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So we have it on video to prove it up in case there are any doubters out there. But. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> I, I have a hard time just standing on in like two seconds. I consistently fall off because the, the skater is very thin, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that must be incredible balance that you have. Yeah. 
you get used to it after a couple of tries. Like our cousin Sam, he once came over here he's from Georgia, so not much hockey there. Mm. But after he skated on the ice for around an hour, he kind of got the hang of it. Oh, okay. so that's good. Yeah, so you were teaching him? Yep, and I also spend this one whole practice, since I used to be a goalie in mites, I spent this whole practice coaching this one goalie, mm -hmm. and I think he might try out for travel this year, I'm not sure, but he had a lot of stuff to learn, and I'm glad I got to teach him that. Oh, that's great. I'm really happy for you. So, John, um, when you're not hanging out with the kids and driving them to hockey practice, you're also a lawyer. Right. right. And so you're super invested in this public speaking with Toastmasters, and you're bringing Mike to it. Why, as a lawyer, are you interested in public speaking? Well, the obvious, I suppose, is that lawyers in the courtroom, anyhow, should be good at it or should be comfortable doing it. And when I was at the Justice Department the first time, it was, uh, it seemed like a normal thing that you were, of course, in a courtroom almost every day and on your feet and speaking and addressing a judge or jury. And then when I went into big firm life for a while, I found out that wasn't necessarily the case. It's not, that's not a knock on big firms, it's sort of the nature yeah. of the beast where big cases, of course, aren't always in the courtroom on a day-to-day -day basis like you are as a, as a prosecutor. And when I went back the second time to the Justice Department as a prosecutor, I was sort of back in that environment where you're yeah. in the courtroom almost every day and you really enjoy it. And when you get out, when you go back to private practice, this, at least for me the second time, I missed it so much, I had to find a place to get my reps, so uh -huh. to speak, where if I wasn't going to be in the courtroom every day, then at least I should be able to force people to listen to me. <laughs> and Toastmasters, of course, provides that opportunity. And our club in particular, I think, is spectacular, wonderful. It has wonderful speakers there. And people have asked me, well, why, why a group of lay people, you know, like the, why aren't you part of the high priests of lawyers who go to some club? And I think they have such clubs, but I, I do not want to part, be a part of that. I, I think the best persuasion comes with regular folks, because after mm. all, you don't have, typically, jurors who are lawyers. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, who said that the lawyers have a monopoly on good speaking? Right. <laughs> yeah. So as you know, and, and truthfully, I think a lot of times I see, in fact, most of the time see that the best speakers are people from all walks of life. Mm -hmm. And they're different styles, different parts of the country, uh, different mannerisms and all the rest, all effective in their own way. And you learn from that. And so it was not only wanting to get the reps, but after being in a club like Guts, mm -hmm. seeing that you really learn quite a bit from all the different speaking styles and the approaches that people take to it. And it's spectacular to watch it really i invite anyone out there to come to our club this is not me just being a shill it is the best <laughs> it is the best hour and a half show on a saturday morning that you can find in the northern virginia area <laughs> <laughs> from beginning to end uh, so it's almost like your creative outlet right it's where you test out your comedy that that's part of it yeah. i have from time to time while protecting the innocent, so to speak, <laughs> given lawyer speeches there as well. Right. And had uh, my audience, while not lawyers, uh, give me their reactions to this, mm. that, or the other, which is really helpful. It's almost like a free jury pool. Yeah. Which otherwise, <laughs> uh, law firms and lawyers will spend a lot of money on to assemble to try and get insights right. from so-called regular folk on what their reactions are to different aspects of uh, of a lawsuit or something like that. But yeah, it's, that's it's, a really interesting yeah. perspective because the people who come to Toastmaster, different ages, yep. a huge diverse crowd. Yep. And yeah, that's like the equivalent of a jury. I've it, never thought of it like that. It's a good cross section of the community. So. Right. <laughs> wow. And they, uh, the one thing that I suppose may not necessarily be uh, emblematic of the real deal experience is that our club pays exceptionally well attention. And mm -hmm. while I try to keep and generate interest in the real deal, yeah. sometimes you don't always have uh, folks who end up on a jury um, who are able to, for whatever reason, fo follow as closely as a, mm -hmm. a Toastmasters club might be invested in doing it. But by and large, it does follow a lot of the same um, experiences that you'll get in front of 
a real journey or a real mock journey even yeah. uh, from from pursuing whatever angle on a, on a lawsuit. So it's very helpful. And so do you, when you go back to your law environment, do you make jokes? Do you use some of the techniques, the drama that you bring from Toastmasters back there? I, I think the short answer is yes. I think I, by the time I had joined Guts, I was pretty well formed on who I right. was and humor was sort of part and parcel of it. Even though as a prosecutor especially, you're not supposed to really joke, but sometimes a little laity every now and then in the courtroom, mm. a little levity that is, will uh, go a long way. And so my um, unofficial rule of thumb anyhow is if you can get your jurors to smile and laugh, yeah. especially if they don't want to be there, <laughs> uh, then you're way ahead of the game. And right. show that you're a real three-dimensional person yeah. who has a sense of humor and I think folks appreciate that. So right. I, try, I try not to make it a, a comedy speech hour or seven eight to eight minutes sure. on whatever yeah, topic like we just talked about. <laughs> but I think having an awareness of opportunities where you can lighten the mood. Yeah. Uh, that goes, that, that rightfully goes some distance with, I think the judge too, the judge and jury that right. this isn't, yeah. We don't have to always be super intense right. on every little aspect of whatever lawsuit or criminal action and the like. Yeah, so Mike, you also do public speaking, right? And this is something that many people are uncomfortable or scared. Do you have an advice for our audience who might have fears of their own and how they can be courageous and you know rise above their fears? Well, I was in a very confident speaker before in third grade, we had an excellent teacher who made us write. He had written a question on the board and then we would answer that question and then we would have to go up to the class and present it. And this year, we present memory verses from the Bible every week and it's a great way to improve our public speaking. And if you keep on practicing, you get the hang of it just like hockey skates. Mm. So I think you really just need to practice because practice makes perfect. Ah, so the key to overcoming your fear is just keep practicing. Now, what about the first moment when you're like about to do something and you're super scared? Like, how do you get over that momentum? I usually just think of something else, like what if this goes right? Then it's perfect moment to think of it and Sometimes when we have presentations I'm not so sure about, I just be in the moment. Wow, thank you, Mike and John, for being here with us. I really sure. appreciate your time. And that's all the time we have for today, folks. And thank you so much for tuning in to the Courage in Flight Show. I'm your host, Dr. Tao Do, a communication coach for high-performance entrepreneurs and professionals. You can learn more about me at taocoach.com. Keep living a powerful and courageous life.